Brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. A couple weeks ago, I was standing in the back of the sanctuary getting ready for worship, and one of our young members came up to me, and she said, Hey, Pastor, did you know that the wise men figurines are in the nativity scene? I said, oh, No. Now, why would that be a problem? Nativity scene. We have it at the back of our sanctuary out there in the narthex. And this young Bethel member comes up and says, but the wise men are there before Christmas. Why is that a potential problem? It's a nativity scene. They're just figuring. Actually, our young member is kind of wise because there are some of us who are nativity scene purists. And nativity scene purists will say that the wise men never go into a manger scene until today, Epiphany Sunday. These days after Christmas, when the wise men show up in the story in the Bible in terms of having arrived at Jesus' side to worship him. Of course, in the traditional Christmas story, which you heard on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, the wise men are never mentioned because they aren't there yet. The shepherds are there, but the wise men aren't. And so for epiphany purists, for wise men purists, we wait until today to put the wise men into the manger scene. Actually, history has suggested, and there's not agreement on this, but there's a bit of a time span, that from a historical perspective, once Jesus was born, it took the wise men somewhere from two months to up to a year to actually get from where they came from to Jesus' side. And so this is when we celebrate in the church here, the arrival of the wise men. Epiphany Sunday. Actually, tomorrow is the day of Epiphany itself. And so that's the thing about this particular Sunday that we celebrate every year. We tend to focus on the three wise men as well we should. This is a monumental day in the church year. And this is when we celebrate the wrapping up of the Christmas story and the arrival of the wise men. Our work throughout history has had a tendency to focus on what we tend to focus on today, the three wise men themselves. You go back to just about any type of painting, any type of sculpture throughout history, and the focal point of that particular piece of art has a tendency to be the three wise men. There's this Flemish tapestry from the 1300s, and what do you have? The three wise men down the center. Giotto, a famous Italian painter from the 1300s, did the exact same thing. You move into the 1400s, into the 1500s, and again and again and again, what you see in fine art is that when it comes to the wise men, the focus tends to be on them. They are the central part of whatever is being depicted. Our work has also illustrated something else that's very, very important, and that is, in a lot of the backgrounds of these pieces of art, the wise men are not the only ones who are there to visit Jesus. And that's important, because what we hear in the Christmas story is that the shepherds went and spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed. And so anywhere from two months to a year after Jesus was born, it only stands to reason that when the shepherds went out that night and started to make widely known this amazing thing that had happened in Bethlehem, it stands to reason that other people showed up on the scene to worship Jesus and to pay homage to him. And so artists have correctly depicted that there are other people who showed up in the meantime as well, but those other people are always put off on the margin. They're always pushed into the background because the central focus of these pieces of art are the wise men themselves. The best piece of art that depicts all of these people who show up to worship Jesus, the best piece of artwork that does that, I would submit to you, is this one right here. Take a peek. This was painted in 1828. And this was painted by a man named Domingos Antonio de Sequeira. He was a Portuguese artist. From a young age, he was considered to be quite an artistic prodigy. He was trained, and at a very, very young age, he ended up being commissioned by churches, by the government in Portugal, to do all kinds of artwork that was very, very much prized and sought after. He was even the royal artist for King John VI. 
And again, today it would be a, like a kid who accelerates through high school and gets a college degree well before 18 to 20 years old. This is what a prodigy this guy was. And what he ended up doing is he ended up depicting the arrival of the wise men in this way. Take just a moment to look at what he did and pay particular attention to why this is different than the way artists typically depicted the same scene. What do you notice about what Sequeira has done that other artists don't do? And what artists and art historians have said is that Sequeira is really one of the only people who ever depicted the arrival of the wise men by focusing mainly on the light, on the star. The star in Sequeira's depiction takes up at least 25% of everything that he puts on the canvas. We'll come back to that in just a moment. What about the people though? Because again, it's about all these different types of people who arrive to pay worship to Jesus and so forth. And what, G what Sekira does, of course, he depicts the wise men. They are there in the foreground by Jesus, and they are calm and they are worshipful as every artist has depicted them to be. And then what Sekiri does is he paints most people in the picture as looking towards Jesus. Of course, Jesus is in Mary's arms, kind of right center. And most of the faces that he paints are looking in Jesus' direction. And yet, not every face is looking towards Jesus. And the faces that don't look towards Jesus are very important. The first ones that don't look toward Jesus is this gaggle of people ostensibly religious leaders, Herod's priests, his teachers, and so forth, the people who counseled Herod on when the star appeared and what that meant and so forth. And what Sekir has done is he's depicted these people as looking up in the sky, not necessarily even looking at the star, just looking up in the sky. And especially the gentleman in the long robe with the hat on looks pretty much confused and concerned about what's happened. Another person that he's depicted is this young baby. And as we talked about in one of our midweek services here a few weeks ago, what he's done with this young baby is something called breaking the fourth wall. What the baby does is instead of looking at Jesus, instead of looking at someone else, he's depicted the baby as looking out at us. And when we see that baby's face, we see that baby looking right at us. That baby has broken the fourth wall. We are looking into the scene, and the three walls are on the left, the right, and behind. And what the baby does is by looking at us, is the baby invites us into that picture. Instead of being passive observers of what's going on, by having the baby look directly at us, now what Sekir wants to do is he wants to make us a part of the action of what's going on. And that's what that baby does. Make no mistake about it, it's a child as well. And that's important because this is what we're celebrating, is the birth of a child. And so it's a child who a little child would lead them, a little child leads us to be a part of this scene as well. And then there's this fellow in the upper left. What we know from history, of course, is that Herod was not there. Herod, of course, didn't know where to go. Herod wanted to try and ruse the Magi to tell him where Jesus was so that he could go worship him. Of course, we know better. Herod didn't want to worship him. In fact, tragically, Herod would end up acting as destructively and murderously as a person could because Herod wanted to retain his own power. This is so sad that an adult man who was called to serve as God's leader of God's religion would turn to absolute murder in order to protect his own kingship. It's pathetic. Herod wasn't on the scene. But maybe what Sekir has done is by painting this person up here in the upper left-hand corner, Herod's dark presence is certainly being felt and is certainly being represented. The gentleman that he depicts, if you look a little bit more closely, he's lofty, he's removed from everybody else, which Herod would have been down in his, uh, down in his castle down in Jerusalem. His arms are crossed, he's brooding. You can tell when you look very closely that this is not someone who is happy with what is going on in front of him. 
And so even though Herod wasn't there historically, Herod's presence is absolutely positively being felt in this. Perhaps the most problematic character in this whole thing is this gentleman right here. He's probably one of the religious leaders, one of the leaders at the temple, the synagogue. He's a guy who leads worship on a weekly basis at the temple. And what is he doing? What he's doing is he not only doesn't look at Jesus, but when you look closely at his eyes, he is looking 180 degrees away from Jesus. He could not be looking farther away from Jesus than anybody else in the painting. The other thing he's doing is he's pushing children. He's holding kids back. He's pushing kids away. And he doesn't want them to get anywhere close to what anyone else is doing for this child who's been born. In fact, when you look at the faces of the kids, they're contorted. Three kids, no less, in this picture have faces that look absolutely aghast at what this guy is doing. They're trying to crane around him to see what's going on. And there's even a hand on that guy pushing back. If that guy right there is the most problematic character in the painting, the most promising character now goes back to the light and to the baby himself that Sekira has depicted. Inasmuch as that guy right there is pushing kids to keep them from being able to see and access the child who's been born, what Sekiera does is he features God pushing his light into every possible corner of the canvas and onto every possible person in the picture as well. In fact, his light is pushing so much that his own son can't help but notice. And when you look at the detail of Jesus, what Sekiera has done, is he shows Jesus as looking back up at the light of the star with absolute amazement. Traditionally on this Sunday, what we do is we focus on the three wise men, and that's normal. That's what we're supposed to do. And yet, as artists have illustrated over the past, there were more than just the three wise men who showed up to worship Jesus and to pay homage to him. And what Sekira has done that no one else had done before or really has done since, is when he depicted this scene, he made the star the star of the whole painting. He made God's light the focal point of everything, not the wise men. And that's something that had never really been done before and never really has been done since. And there's something else that's going on here, too that particularly on this Sunday, is important for us to take note of. Something else that Sekira may have done, and it's hard to know if he did this intentionally or not, but it's there, has to do with this. In medieval printing, in book printing, when writers were writing down sentences and they wanted to emphasize something of a joyous nature, what they would do is they would put down two Latin letters at the end of a sentence, I and O. And I and O in Latin mean joy. And so when they would punctuate the end of a sentence with this Latin mashup of I and O, that was a way of depicting absolute joy for what they had just said in the sentence before. It was a kind of a way for them to say hooray or whatever. What ended up happening over time is by the 1400s, that Latin mashup of I and O, instead of being put next to each other, got put on top of each other. And the I went on top, and the O went on the bottom, and we know it as an exclamation point these days. By the 1400s, manuscripts are showing exclamation points as a way of depicting absolute joy, of depicting admiration at what it is that they had just said in the sentence before. And so to that, by 1828, Sekiera's lightest parts of his painting can be outlined with the shape that I've put up there for ease of seeing. <laughs> Don't know if he intended it, but it's absolutely there when you look at the painting. And where 
Is that lightest of stuff pointing to in admiration, wonderment, and amazement? You can't make this stuff up. And so, my friends, that is really an epiphany to celebrate on this day. The Lord be with you. All right, Hartman's Hollister, come on up.